Hello everyone. In the previous three videos, we talked about the Z-transform, the inverse Z-transform, and properties of the Z-transform. In this video, we will talk about Z-transform solution of linear difference equation. The topics we will cover in this video are the zero input response. So I have a system here and there is no input and I need to know what is the output. And the output will be based on initial conditions or energy stored inside the system. So the output basically will consist of the characteristic mode of the system, something like minus 0.3 n u of n. And eventually it will just die out. So you can think of it, you have a system, you turned it on, and it gives you some output and it will die out this output based on energy stored in the system from previous use. Then we will learn how to derive the transfer function h of z of the system using the z transform from a difference equation that looks something like this. How do we find h of z of the system? The third topic will be zero state response. So now you have the system, there is an input, and we are giving the difference equation of the system or the impulse response or h of z, the transfer function, and we need to find y of n. And we call it zero state response because there is no initial condition stored in the system. So the system is responding only to the input. And the fourth topic is system stability. If you are giving h of z or the difference equation that describes the system, can you determine if the system is stable or not? Basically, if you have an input, is the output of the system will go to infinity or clip out or burned, or is it gonna give you good data or good output? Okay, so let's start with the zero input response. Here, we will be using three property. The first property is linearity. The second property is the time shifting to take into account initial conditions stored in the past. And the third property will be convolution. So when we find the zero input response, we will be using a shift property because we assume there is energy stored in the system in the past. So we will be using the unilateral Z-transform we discussed in the previous video. So let's take this example and go over it and see how to find the zero input response. So given the initial condition, Y at minus one, that's like one unit time before N equals zero or T equals zero. The initial condition or the energy is one, Y minus two is two. Use the unilateral Z transform to solve the second order constant coefficient linear difference equation. Find the zero input response of the system. And the system has these initial conditions. And we will be using the Z transform. So we will find the Z transform of this difference equation. And we will take into consideration the initial conditions. Now, if the problem was given to you and this difference equation was in the advanced form, convert it to this form, the delayed form, the basically y of n minus 1, not y of n plus 1. So when we find the z-transform, we will get y minus 1 and y minus 2. Instead of y plus 1, y plus 2, then we will do extra step to find their values. But here in the problem is already given y minus 1 and y minus 2. So this is already in the delayed form, which is good. So if I find the Z transform of this one, Y of N, that will be Y of Z plus 0.4. Now this is delayed one unit. So I'm going to use the shifting property. So that will be Z minus one Y of Z and the initial condition. So that will be plus Y minus one. 
Now the Z transform of this one will be minus 0.32. This is shifted to unit, so that V minus 2. And the initial condition, which is equal. Now we said we are after the zero input response. That means there is no input. So all these are zero. Okay, after we find the Z transform of this difference equation, now let's find what is Y of Z. So I will take Y of Z as a common factor from these terms here. So I will get all these initial conditions, I will gather them together. Now I'm going to plug values for these initial conditions and I should get something like this. And these values here came from the stated problem here. Now keep y of z in one side of the equation and everything goes to the other side of the equal sign. So y of z is this term will become minus 0.4 minus 0.32 times 2 that will be minus 0.24 and this will be minus 0.32 z minus 1. Now we are more comfortable with z to a positive power instead of z to a negative power. When it is to a positive power, it's easy to factor it out. So I can multiply numerator and denominator by z square and z square, since the highest power is negative 2. So this will be, multiply this negative time here, so that will be 0.24, And that's y of z. Now we can do partial fraction expansion that we have done in previous videos. I will skip the steps for the partial fraction expansion, but the first step you do, bring one of these z under the y of z. So you can rewrite this y of z over z. Now, if you do partial fraction expansion, you will get the following. I skipped the steps just to save time. And as I said, we have done it before in previous video. So Y of Z in this case will be, all I did, I just brought this Z back here. Now I can use the table to find the inverse Z transform and Y of N will be minus 0.11. And this is the solution. This is the zero input response. That means the system responding to energy stored in it. So basically based on this energy, the system will give you the characteristic mode of the system. And with time, eventually these values will die out to zero. Okay, so this is how do we find the zero input response if we are given the difference equations and the initial conditions. Now the next topic is how do we find the transfer function h of z of linear time invariant discrete system? So in general, any system, doesn't matter how complex it is, can be described by this difference equation. In this case, it is in the advanced mode, not in the delay mode. When I say advanced mode, that means n plus k. If it was in the delayed mode, this would have been y of n, and this would have been 
i of n minus k. But when we try to find the transfer function h of z, it's better to convert the difference equation to be in the advanced form. So z will be always to a positive power. So the next step, you find the z transform of this difference equation. You gather y of z from all these factors. So here you will get a binomial. We call it a of z. And the same thing here. We take x of z as a common factor, and then we will get this polynomial, and we call it b of z h of z, the transfer function, will be y of z divided by x of z, which is this polynomial, b of z, which all this term divided by these terms, a of z. And that will be the transfer function. And when we do the z transform of this difference equation, we ignore all initial conditions because the transfer function depends on the parameter, on the components in the system. It doesn't depend on initial condition or energy stored in the system because these will always vary depend on the previous use. So all these initial condition y minus 1, y minus 2 all set to 0 when we do the z transform. So let's take this example to demonstrate how to find h of z. Find the transfer function h of z and the impulse response h of n of the system described by this difference equation. Okay, so let's start. Let's clean up. So let's take the z transform of this equation. So that will be y of z. See, I will ignore the initial condition here, y minus 1. Now I will take this y of z as a common factor. Also I will take x of z as a common factor. So h of z will be y of z divided by x of z. Now I will multiply numerator and denominator by z squared to get rid of this negative power. And this is the transfer function of the system. Now if I need to find the impulse response h of n, then I need to do the inverse z transform of this equation. So let's take one of these z here under h of z. So that will be h of z. And let's factor out this denominator. And then again, we do partial fraction expansion. This will be So I'm going to bring now this z back up here. So h of z will be and I will use the table to find the inverse z transform of this and this. So h of n will be and that's the impulse response of the system. So if I excite the system by an impulse like this that's what I will get. And this we call then the characteristic modes of the system. And when we did the zero input response and there was energy in the system, the output consists only of these characteristic modes, which are here. These will depend on the initial condition or the energy stored in the system. And usually if the system is stable, this with time or as n get larger this quantity will go to zero if it's marginally stable it will be just oscillating 
but the amplitude will not go to infinity. Okay, the third topic is the zero state response of the system. So zero state means there is no initial condition, all initial conditions are zero, or there is no energy stored in the system. So how do we find the system response to the input? So if I have a system and they described it by the impulse response h of n, then I can find the output y of n in the time domain by the convolution of the input with the system impulse response. Now, if I want to do the same operation in the z domain, which is easier, so I find the z transform of x of n, that's x of z. I find the z transform of h of n, that will be the transfer function h of z. Now the output y of z is just going to be the simple multiplication. The input times the transfer function. And here we use the convolution property that we discussed in the previous video. Convolution is usually tedious. Pure algebraic multiplication is very simple. Okay, so let's take an example to demonstrate how do we find the zero state response of a system for a given input. We are given this input x of n and we want to use the z transform to determine the zero state response y of n of a causal linear time invariant discrete system described by this difference equation. So the first step we need to find transfer function h of z. And we already did this in the previous example because we dealt with the same system. And we found h of z from the previous example, this one. Now to find x of z, for the input, we will use the table and it will be exactly this value. Now to find y of z, the zero state response, it's just h of z time x of z. So this will be, so that's this one, h of z here, time x of z, which is this one. Again, I will take one of these z under y of z, so I don't have to do long division since z in the numerator is z times this times this is z cube, and in the denominator z times this z cube, so I have to do a long division, or it's easier, I take one of the z under y of z, so this will be y of z, and in the numerator now I will have only this. Now, in the denominator, I can factor out this times this. Now, again, we will use partial fraction expansion of this term, and it will be in this form. I will skip the steps to find A and B and C, and if you do it, it should be so now I will express y of z here and that z I'm going to bring it now up here so this will be And now we will take the inverse z transform, and this will be the output y of n. This 20 over 9 is just 2.22. And this will be 1.85. And this will be 0.926. And this is the answer. This is the zero state response, which is the system responding purely to the input here. 
if we look at this output, it consists first of the characteristic modes of the system. Also, it has the waveform of the input signal, which is this minus 0.5 to the power of n. Now, what are the region of convergence? So far here, we are dealing with causal system. That means H of n exists for n larger than zero. Also, we are dealing with causal input. That means X of n also exists for n equal or larger than zero. Let's clean this like here. See, it exists for positive n. That means the region of convergence will be outward. And if I draw the poles of the system and the input in the z domain, let's clean up. It has a pole at minus 0.8, so that's somewhere here. And one at 0.4, this is somewhere here. And the input has at minus 0.5, so somewhere here. So for this, then the region of convergence has to be outside the 0.8. For this Z transform to exist. So this one will be Z, the magnitude larger than 0.8. Okay, now let's take another example where you need to find the zero input response and the zero state response. So let's demonstrate the steps for this example. So in this example, we are giving the initial condition, so there is energy stored in the system. We have also input to the system, and we are giving the difference equation of the system. And we are asked to find the total response, y of n. That means y of n now will consist of the zero input response plus the zero state response. So how do we solve these problems? The steps to solve this problem will consist of the three steps we did in example one, example two, and example three. In this case, I will not go through the whole problem, but I will show you the initial steps. Then the partial fraction expansion and the inverse can be done. Let's just clean up first. Well, since we are given initial conditions, when we do the Z transform of this difference equation, we have to take into consideration the initial conditions and use unilateral shifting property. So Z transform of this one will be the following. Okay, so this is the Z transform. Now, I will gather all Y and Z together, this, and I will gather all initial conditions together. And X of Z will gather together. This x minus 1 is 0 since the input is causal. It only exists for n0 and positive n. So this will be Now I will bring this component after the equal sign and divide this component and this component by this coefficient of y of z. So I have y of z by itself. And this one will be Now, if I plug values for these initial conditions, which are these ones here, I should get the following.
If I plot for x of z, the z transform of this equation of x of n here, which will be z over z plus 0.5. One more thing, since this z to the power of minus 2, I will multiply numerator and denominator by z squared. So I will be dealing with z to the positive power and add this with this one so it will be okay so far these terms here depend on the initial conditions now this is the zero input response it is here because of initial conditions now this term here is the zero state response it's the system responding to this input now here you have two choices you can find the partial fraction expansion of this term and you will get the zero input response which is exactly the same as the one we found in example one here. And if you do the partial fraction expansion of this system, then you will get the zero state response, which is exactly the same as in example three, this one. So that's one option. The other option is instead of doing the partial fraction expansion twice, one for here, one for here, I will combine these two terms to one term and do only one partial fraction expansion. Then you will get the output, which is the total response that consists of both the zero input and the zero state response. And you will not be able to tell how much of the total output belong to the zero input response and how much of it belong to the zero state response. So if we combine these two terms, this term and this term, then we will get the following. But let's clean up first. So I will create a common denominator, which is this one. And if I multiply these, by this one and this term here by this one, I should get in the numerator the following. Now let's add terms here similar like z cube with this one and z square with this z square and factor out this component. So y of z will be And before we do the partial fraction expansion, let's take one z from each one of these. So we have y of z and put it down at the denominator of y of z. And then this will be So now in the numerator, z is to the power of square, in the denominator, z to the power of 3. So I don't need to do long division. And then partial fraction expansion, a over z plus 0.8. And then do some algebraic to find a, b, and c. There are different methods. And then bring z up here. You should get y of z. And use the table to find the inverse z transform and the total response let's call it the total response and this is the total response you cannot tell how much of these output belong to the zero input response which is here 
and how much of it belonged to the zero state response. All I can guarantee is the following. These components here belong to the zero state response, means it belong to the input here. But this characteristic mode of the system, part of it because of energy stored in the system, initial conditions, and part of it of the new input that hit the system. And if I add the zero input response plus the zero state response, I should get this one. For example, if I add this component from the zero input and the zero state, I should get the 2.116. Let's see, add this component, that's from the zero state response, 2.22 and this component that's coming from the zero input response you will get the same as here and you can do the same thing for this characteristic mode the 2.22 it will consist of both component from the zero input response and the zero state response okay in this example we will see how to find the output if we have causal and non-causal input. So given two-sided input x of n that consists of a causal part and non-causal part, use the z-transform to determine the zero state response y of n for causal system described by this transfer function. I will not go through the detail of this example because we have done several of them, partial fractional expansion and inverse z-transform and so forth, but the idea. Now, to solve this problem, you have to determine first the region of convergence and make sure there is a common region of convergence between the inputs and the transfer function of the system. So let's shrink this a little bit. For the transfer function h of z, the region of convergence is outside this circle of radius half because it has a pole in the denominator equal half. So this is the region of convergence for h of z. Now for this part of the input, we need to find its z transform. So let's call it x1 of n. So then the z transform of this one, since it's causal, it will be this one. And the region of convergence will be outward. And it has a pole at 0 0.8. So for x1, The second part of the input is a non-causal signal and if we do the z transform and let's call it x2 of n. Now the z transform of this non-causal signal will be this one and the region of convergence will be less than 2 because it has a pole 2 at 2 and it's non-causal so it's inward. So it will be this big circle. Well, since there is a common region of convergence between these two inputs, I can add them up together and treat them as one input. But when I do the inverse, I have to keep track. So the common region of convergence for these two will be z is larger than 0.8, but less than 2. So z. And for h of z, it's larger than 0.5. So it has also a common region of convergence between 0.8 and 2. Why there should be a common region of convergence? Because when we do the inverse z transform, we do the contour integral. Here in this course, we do partial fraction expansion, but contour integral, the path of the contour has to be inside the region of convergence for all signals. So since they have three of them, same common region of convergence, then I can add this and I can add this. So I can add x1 of z and x2 of z and call it just x of z, which will give me this one. And then the output will be x of z time h of z, which is this one. Then we carry out partial fraction expansion as before, and we will get these three components. Now, when we do the inverse z transform, we have to be careful. This one is 0 0.5, which is this pole here, and it's outward. So that will be a causal signal, and it will be this one, u of n. This part 
has a pole at 0.8 and the region of convergence is outward from this pole so this is also going to be a causal signal so that's the inverse z transform now this part has a pole at 2 and the region of convergence is less so that's inward so then this part will be anti-causal and the inverse will be this one and that's how we work with causal and non-causal input now let's look at this example where they have disjoint region of convergence let's clean up first now in this example I have the same system with region of convergence outside the pole 0.5 and this system has an input that consists of two parts and let's call this one x1 of n and this one x2 of n and we need to find the zero state response what's y of n so first we need to find the z transform of x1 and that's the z transform and the region of convergence is 0.8 outward so that would be this one and the z transform of this anti-causal and this is the z transform and this is the region of convergence since it's anti-causal it's inward so this is x1 of z this is x2 of z and this is the system h of z now when you solve this problem you will notice x1 of z and x2 of z has no common region of convergence like the previous problem but each one of them has a common region of convergence with h of z for these two the common region of convergence is z larger than 0.8 for these two the common region of convergence is z has to be less than 0.6 the magnitude and larger than 0.5 so the region of convergence is something like this so if i find the inverse z transform the contour integral will be like inside this region of convergence so i can find the inverse let's clean up so to solve this problem break it down to two separate problems first find the system response to this input and call it y1 of z so it will be hz time x1 of z and you will get this term then do partial fraction expansion and you will get this one then do the inverse z transform and the region of convergence is larger than 0.8 so they are both causal and you will get this value that's the output y1 of n for this input then again find the system response to this non-causal signal x2 of n so it will be this term time again this and you will get y2 of z this one then do partial fraction expansion and the region of convergence you determine this one now this term has a pole at 0.5 so the region of convergence it's outward so that would be a causal when you do the inverse z transform this term has a pole at 0.6 and the region of convergence is inward so that would be anti-causal and that's y2 of n the last example or the last scenario is the following let's clean up now in this example we have a system transfer function and the input don't have a common region of convergence so in this example we have h of z the region of convergence is outward and then we have this input and if i find x of z for this one it will be with the region of convergence z less than 0.3 so then if i draw it this is 0.5 and this will be 0.3 inward so h of z and x of z they don't have common region of convergence if you say y of z equal x of z time h of z it's undefined you can multiply them mathematically but then when you do the inverse you need to do the contour integral to do the inverse there is no common region between them this one here and the other one 0.5 is outward 
So there is no common region of convergence for this contour to exist. So the inverse doesn't exist and the signal doesn't exist. If you try to solve it in the time domain by convolution and you say y of n will equal minus infinity to infinity using the convolution 0.3 m If you carry out this convolution because of these, this goes to minus infinity and this will equal 1 and this will force it to go to n. So this will go to n. And I can express this as n can take 0.5 n out and this will be 0.3 m time 0.5 minus m and this will be here and if you use the summation formula this will be r is 0.3 over 0.5 to the power of minus infinity so now this term here you can think of it as 3 over 5 to the power of minus infinity or it is 5 over 3 to the power of infinity. Now this one will go to infinity. So y of n is undefined. So when there is no region of convergence between the transfer function and the input, then the output is undefined. And usually in real application, here we did it mathematically, but in real application, all systems are causal and all inputs are causal. So there will always be a region of convergence but there will be a scenario where the input can cause a problem for the system if there is no feedback and so forth. So the last part in this video is system stability. So let's clean up. So how do we determine the system stability? Internally stable or asymptotically stable? It will always depend on the poles. So the first step, draw the unit circle in the Z domain. So if you are giving the transfer function of the system h of z, it could be of any order, third, fourth, fifth order. You always can factor out the numerator and denominator in this form. So this will be like, and also factor out the denominator and you can factor it in this form. Now, this one here, are the zeros of the system that means the value if z equals z1 h of z will be zero and these are the poles of the system so if z equal p1 or p2 or p3 h of z will go to infinity so now draw the zeros and the poles in the z domain now if all the poles inside the unit circle here or here, anywhere, then the system is asymptotically stable. Why? Because if you do partial fraction expansion of this one, you will get something like a over z minus b1 plus b over z minus b2 plus c over z minus b3. And then if you do the inverse z transform, this will be a p1 to the power of n plus Now, A and B and C are constant, but look at P1. If P1 is larger than 1, that means it's outside the unit circle, then we have a problem. For example, if it was like 1.2, then as N goes to infinity, this, or get larger, this become larger and larger and go to infinity. So then H of N will not be defined or will collapse the system. The system cannot give you just infinite voltage or infinite signal. That's why P1, P2, P3 has to be inside the unit circle. That means their magnitude has to be less than 1. So this will always, like if it's 0 0.8, with N will eventually die out. And that's a practical system. And the other thing for the system to be real, if you have a pole that is complex, let's say something here. Let's call this P1. Then you have to have the conjugate. P2. So if P1 is like 0.6 Ej 
pi over 6, then this has to be 0.6e minus j pi over 6 for the system to be real. Now the zeros, it doesn't matter. The zeros can be anywhere, can be here, outside, and we usually represent them by a circle and the poles by x. Let's clean up to see now this condition. Now, if you have poles on the unit circle, for example, you may have P1 here and P2 here and P3 here. Now we call the system marginally stable. Why? Because these will be 1 EJ, for example, pi over 4. And this will be 1 E minus J pi over 4. And when I have these, if I combine these and find the inverse Z transform, we saw it in previous video, we will get something like this. 1 to the power of N cosine pi over 4 N. So H of N in this case, will just oscillate forever. As long as the system is on, H of N, if you excite it by an impulse, it will just give you this cosine function with a digital frequency pi over four. And it will stay on like this until you turn off the system. So we call it marginally stable. For this one, if that was this term P3, which is C over Z minus one, then the inverse Z transform would be just one N. And then you have C. So that would be just a DC of amplitude C and it would just stay like this. So in this case, this is like a function generator, you can think of it. That you turn on the function generator, it just give you a sine wave as long as the function generator is on. So if you have a pole on the unit circle, then we call it marginally stable. Now a system is unstable if you have at least one pole outside the unit circle then this system is unstable because h of n will be gamma that is gamma here if we call this is gamma to the power of n and if gamma is larger than one this will go to infinity so the system is unstable or the second condition if you have repeated roots on the unit circle that also will make the system unstable so let's clean up to see this scenario. So if we have repeated roots, let's say one here and another one here, right on top of each other, and one here and another one here. Now it will be fourth order system. So now I will have another one here, Z minus P4. So these two, P1 and P2 could be the same and they are here. P3 and P4, same and they are here. This will make the system unstable. Why? Because now if I do the inverse transform of this and this, I will end up with N, there will be some constant, let's call it C, cosine, and let's call this pi over 4. So that will be pi over 4 N. Because of the repeated roots, you have this N. And we did this in a previous video when you have a repeated root always you're going to have that n and now this h of n will go to infinity as n get larger so h of n will look something like this and the system is unstable so in summary the system is not stable if you have a pole outside the unit circle or you have repeated poles on the unit circle this system is stable internally or asymptotically stable if all the poles are inside the unit circle. If you have one poles and repeated poles on the unit circles like here and here, then we call it marginally stable. Well, this end today's lecture in this video. And next video, we will talk about important topic, which is black diagrams and system realization. Thank you and see you soon.